It's been a long, hot journey. Jesus and his disciples have been traveling for miles down a long, hot, dusty road. It's high noon, and they're exhausted. They're more than ready to stop for a bite to eat. Lunch has been due for <laughs> half an hour or so. They're on their way back to Galilee from Judea, and right smack dab in the middle of their trip is Sychar, a little village in the middle of hated Samaria. You get into town, find some bread, and get out. It won't be long and this God-forsaken town will be nothing but a spot in the rearview mirror. Thanks be to God. Get into town, find some bread, get out. Tired from the journey, Jesus sits down by Jacob's well and the disciples, they say, uh, you stay here, we'll go on in. They've got a one-item checklist in hand. Find bread. <laughs> by the way, don't you just love it when your beloved sends you into town with nothing more than one item on the honeydew list? You almost can't mess it up. <laughs> As Jesus was resting, a Samaritan woman, she approaches the well She's there to draw some water, and Jesus, of all people, he asks her to give him a drink. The woman just about falls over. She can't believe his request. This is a total breach of protocol. First, he's a holy man, and she's a woman. Devout Jewish men, they don't talk with women in public, period. It's not done. The risk was too high, the risk of impurity, the risk of gossip, the risk of ultimately being drawn into immorality or, or the, even the hint of possible sin. Yet here Jesus is a holy man engaging her, not her engaging him in conversation. Not only that, but the second strike is she's a Samaritan. And we all know that Jews don't have anything to do with those half-breeds. In fact, simply sharing a, a cup of, of water or a dish with her would make Jesus unclean. Yet here Jesus is, and it is he who is asking her. Him who is striking up the conversation and saying, Would you give me a drink? Compounding both of the previous problems is the fact that this woman is obviously of poor moral character. The normal time for women to draw water would be in a much cooler time of the day. Yet her watch shows it's almost 1230 now. In fact, it's the hottest part of the day. This woman has obviously come at a time when she knows that she is the least likely to see anyone at least anyone who knows her and knows her past. She is an outsider amongst outsiders. And yet Jesus will soon show that he knows all about her past, and yet he still loves her anyway. She's been married five times, but don't blame that on her. Women in her day could not divorce their husbands. Only men had that kind of power. The text offers no reason as to why her husbands had divorced her so many times or why she is currently living with a man who is not her husband. Perhaps she had been barren, unable to give them the children that they so desperately longed for, and because she was barren, they went looking for someone that was maybe not so barren. We don't know why, and she doesn't tell us why. Perhaps we do well to worry less about what got her into this mess and focus more on the opportunity that's sitting right there in front of her. On the surface, you'd think that a pious Jewish man and a loose Samaritan woman would have absolutely nothing to talk about. However, it turns out that the two of them have the longest recorded conversation in the Gospels. Before the woman knows it, a discussion about something as simple as a cup of cool water has turned into a holy encounter with a living God. 
She had come to Jacob's well looking for water to fill her jar, and instead she'd found bread. Bread that would soon be broken for her and people just like her. It's been a long, hot, early summer's journey. Twenty-some preachers have shown up in Marion. They're on a mission. They won't be here for long. They just need to refuel, stop and get some spiritual seminary bread for their pastoral journey. They've got narrative sermons to write, board members to impress, degrees to hang on their walls. They've got a one-item checklist in hand. It says, complete one elective. And it's with Lucetti. Get in, get what you need, get out. Come Friday evening, this town will be nothing but a spot in the rearview mirror. Yet somewhere in Marion, just outside a Dollar General store, sits a young woman. She's got long, sandy brown hair that's obviously been bleached one too many times. There's a cheap cigarette in her hand. She'd love to quit, but she lost the willpower to do so a long time ago. She's got three kids in tow by three different dads, and the guy that's living with them now will leave them just as soon as he finds out that number four is on the way. Yet the bruises on her arm, neck, and lower back indicate that maybe his moving on might not be such a bad thing after all. Only moments ago she used up the last of her food stamps. Too many mouths to feed and not nearly enough money to go around. She sits there staring at the ground, surrounded by people and screaming kids, but lonely, broken hurt. Her own flesh and blood have given up on her. She can't remember the last time that her mom or dad even gave her a call. She's hungry and she's in desperate need of bread. Here come the disciples. They've just been to the Panera Bread Company and they have just about bought the whole place out. They were in such a rush to get in and out of town that when they left to go in, they forgot to even ask Jesus for his order. Not knowing what he might be in the mood for, they picked up all the, the staples, white, wheat, French, ciabatta, tomato, basil, and of course, Jewish rye. <laughs> but wait, who is this he's talking to? Is that a Samaritan woman sitting and talking to him out by the well? Doesn't he know the protocol? Perhaps if we ignore the whole situation, it will just go away. In fact, praise God, there it goes, sprinting back to her God-forsaken community. Hey, Jesus, Simon yells, are you ready for some lunch? We didn't know what you might be in the mood for, and we forgot to ask, so we grabbed a variety of all the staples. Don't worry about the leftovers. It, it wouldn't be the first time we've had a few basketfuls. I know we've got way too much, but the Zebedee boys said that they'd take care of all the leftovers. You're not hungry, Jesus? What, what do you mean you're not hungry? You've been on the same journey that we have been on. Did you order takeout while we were away? Did that woman bring you something to eat? The disciples were well-meaning, but they just, they just didn't get it. So Jesus explains to them in no uncertain terms that bread isn't just something you run into town, you shove into your face, you quickly digest, and then you just simply move on. Bread, real bread. It's more than that. In fact, in, in verse 34 of John chapter 4, Jesus says this. He says, My food, it is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. To do his will. He talks not only about bread and, and doing 
the will of the Father, but about a harvest field that is ripe. A harvest field that's right in front of their eyes. A harvest field that a broken Samaritan woman has just sprinted into to go minister to. A harvest field that those same disciples had just been in and out of and had left with nothing more than a full belly and a completed one-item checklist. Disciples, Jesus says, listen up. You think that ministry happens just back home, back in Galilee? Open your eyes. Look at the fields. They're, They're all around you. Yes, they're in Galilee, but they're here too. And they're ripe for harvest. Not only that, he says, but that woman, that one that you dismissed, that one that you ignored, that one that you looked right past and you prayed would just go away, that woman, she's now your sister by faith. And because of her testimony, not yours, many in that God-forsaken town will soon be your brothers and sisters as well. It's been a long journey. Twenty-some preachers have gathered in Marion, Indiana. They've come for seminary bread, but let's be real, for many of us, it's just another stop along the journey. Get in, get what you need, get out. Yet somewhere in town, just outside a Dollar General store, sits a woman, three kids in tow, broken, and longing for bread. I must confess that as I've wrestled with this text throughout this week, I've had to ask God to forgive me. To forgive me for walking right by her and so many like her. To forgive me for being so focused on my one item checklist, narrative preaching, and why I think that I'm here, that I'm afraid I've missed why it is that I really am here. Could it be that I'm here for more than just food for thought? Could it be that I'm here not just to get some seminary bread, but rather I'm here to feed? To feed the broken, the beaten up, the hungry? I wonder what might happen if we as a group of seminarians, even though many of us were just merely passing through, if we, like Jesus, would choose to engage in the lives of the broken and the hungry, right here in Marion, before we leave town. Perhaps a common conversation started over something as simple as a cup of cool water could turn into a holy conversation, a divine appointment about an amazing God who is full of mercy and grace, a God who knows everything that we've ever done and loves us anyway. I dare say that one gospel conversation shared in a true spirit of love and compassion could lead not just to one broken life finding bread, but many, perhaps even our own. Father God, I just pray that um, you would enable us to have eyes to see what you see. Forgive me for my one-item checklist. Allow me to see the harvest field. Amen.